Well, thank you very much. A 30-year anniversary prompts all of us to think back to the past. So, um, in 1994, obviously the Berlin Wall had fallen, Germany had united, the, United, uh, sorry, the Soviet Union had dissolved peacefully, unlike the former Yugoslav Republic, which did, dis, um, did degenerate into war. In 1992, the Treaty on the European Union was signed, the single market, we've talked a lot about it. And in 1993, the EU promised to enlarge to Central Europe. And allow me also to remind you, in 1994, the Budapest Memorandum was signed, which, uh, whereby Ukraine returns um, its nuclear uh, and its arms to Russia in exchange for territorial integrity, to, for a guarantee in territorial integrity. So that was peak European integration. That was the highest moment of European integration. So it's worth looking at what were the key ingredients. And I would say there are three. Mutual economic benefits, scale, and civic political values. So let me just say a few things about these three features. The first is um, mutual economic benefits. The whole idea, the whole intuition of Jean Monnet was that by providing, by economically integrating, Europeans would end conflict. So the idea is that economic interdependence was a force for good and a means for pacification. And that created a very attractive model. It created a model that allowed the original plan of European integration to embrace scale. The progressive enlargement of the European Union in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, the signing of the um, uh, EFTA agreement, and of course trade on a global, on a global scale as well. The second dimension to which enabled scale was, admittedly, the US security umbrella. Um, at that time, the US was still uncontested, and indeed NATO expanded too, in a way that in the 1990s was relatively uncontroversial, despite what Putin says today. And then the third dimension is the political union and the civic political values that the European Union embraced and that are reflected in the rule of law of the single market, therefore they are on, on a pan-European uh, level. Um, the Copenhagen criteria, which were drawn down uh, 31 years ago in 1992 in order to allow EU enlargement, was, was the first document that really outlines what these political values were, and it's a, you know, a market economy, but it's also a democracy. And these are very important um, features and good neighborly relations. Fast forward to today, and what do we have? We have great power competition that is mostly reflected in a direction towards bi bipolarity through the US-China rivalry. Um, below this, we also have a lot of multipolarity because a lot of countries and states are refusing this type of bifurcation of world order and are hedging to see what benefits they could they could gain from a fractured international environment. So we're seeing several actors which perhaps 10 years ago were of limited influence on their regions, now playing an overt role in influencing uh, dynamics. We're seeing them in Asia, we're seeing them in Africa, we're seeing them in Europe as well. Through this process, we're seeing that the tool that enabled the peak European integration, and that is economic interdependence, has actually been weaponized. So it's been totally turned upside down through geopolitics. Um, and, and therefore, economic inter integration becomes a challenge. And I, I'll, I'll get back to, to that in a moment. Um, we're also seeing that states and great power rivalry reflects a, a state quest for the monopoly of instruments of power. And this is in the face of trends that are actually transnational, such as technology, such as climate. So there's a bit of a contradiction in some of the dynamics that are taking place on the international level because we see a return of the state and a quest for state power in the face of trends that are hard to control through state power alone. And of course, climate and technology. 
is one of the is uh, are the two big drivers. There are others: democracy or the the failures of democracy, demography. In this context, we're seeing that cooperation as a value is being degraded. We are seeing that international rules, uh, the rule of law, the liberal international order, call it as you wish, is also being degraded. I think the political response to the actions of the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court are very telling of an attitude towards the, the, um, the um, a liberal world, world order and international rules. So in this context, in this, in this, at this juncture, what can be done? What can Europe do? Um, and I agree fully with what has been said so far. This is a critical juncture. Um, it is a moment that if, is, if it is missed, it's probably, it would mark uh, an, um, an irreversible decline for Europe. We are already in decline, but it would become, it would mark the irreversibility. So what can be done? There are plenty of ideas circulating. The Letta report is one. The Draghi report is due next month. Another report will be due in October on Europe's resilience and defence. And I think there's no alternative to upgrading and upscaling the single market. So that's a question of size, but it's also a question of depth and quality. And many of these ideas have been mentioned, back, banking union, capitals, market union. There are many there. The controversies are political, how to fund it, uh, how to ensure equal redistribution among members, large member, member states versus the smaller ones, etc. But this is, it has to be done. And political choices will be needed and, well, the, I think the outcome of the next um, European Parliament elections will be telling of whether that political will, will be forth, forthcoming. The second dimension is enlargement. Um, the, the EU has made promises to Ukraine, Mol Moldova, Georgia, if Georgia fulfills certain conditions, which at the moment it isn't, and also to the Western Balkans, and important decisions need to be made in that regard. This, again, it's also a question of scale. It's not just a question of being altruistic. It's a question of imagining a larger single market, more integrated, more dynamic, more competitive, that includes a broader geography. Um, and I think this is very important. Um, it's a big project. And then the third dimension is the political values. So I'm going back to the original features that were, you know, that came out from peak, into peak Europe. Um, and the political civic values need to circulate around the notion of democracy and rule of law. Enlargement cannot be pursued purely for geopolitical reasons because it will backfire. It needs to be accompanied by a broader and deeper view of democratic processes and practices and how they work because this will be the insurance for Europe surviving in this dangerous world. I'd like to, I'm gonna end now with a Jean Monnet quote, but it's not the usual one about Europe being forged in crises, which, I mean, we've, we've been in a crisis for 15 years and I, I haven't seen that much forging going on. So, but it's, it's another quotation. War is in men's minds, and I apologize, he was writing in the 1950s, so he only referred to men. War is in men's minds, and it must be opposed by imagination. And if I think back at that period when the Berlin Wall came down, um, and the outcomes that I mentioned, the unification of Germany, enlargement, uh, EU and NATO enlargement, it wasn't obvious that it would go that way. Hmm? Um, it wasn't obvious that Germany would be united. It wasn't obvious that the Soviet Union would dissolve peacefully. And this, if it was done, it was because of political leadership, ability to seize the opportunity, and, a, and you know, a, a coalition of forces that enabled this. Of course, in those days, there was the US, but US policy, for instance, wasn't particularly in favor of German unification at the beginning. It took the entrepreneurship of Kohl to achieve this. So I think if we look back and try to put ourselves in the shoes of political leaders who have accomplished great historic events, I think it's important to think about that when we're looking at today's challenges. 
because with the value of cooperation being degraded, with the idea that rule of law is not important, with the return of transactional politics around the world, but also among us, then the big picture get, gets lost in favor of the um, short -term, of short-term gains. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for that.